Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. This year's session of the United Nations Commission on Status of Women was recently held in New York. The UNCSW is a platform for delegates from different countries and organizations to come together and discuss the progress of issues relating to women's rights and gender equality. Today, we are joined by Sanam Amin from the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development to discuss this year's proceedings. Hi Sanam, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Firstly, can you tell us about the reports, various reports, which uh, talked about how the United States is attempting to dilute the language of the outcome document and remove the words uh, gender and replace it with women and girls instead, and is also against the use of language on reproductive rights and comprehensive sec uh, sexual education. Can you tell us how successful the United States attempts were? So to answer your question regarding how successful they were, I think I should give a little bit of context about the Commission on the Status of Women itself, which is one of the oldest commissions under the United Nations, and in fact predates many of the core human rights conventions, including the Commission on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. Hmm. So traditionally, uh, this has been a very progressive space, um, and that means that a lot of conversations of topics relating to the issues that you mentioned, including reproductive rights, have taken place over the years. Hmm. There are a lot of fallback uh, positions, um, including for conservative and more religious groups that are a bit touchy about these subjects. Yeah. Now, the fact that we are stuck on the same agreements from 20 even 30 years ago mm -hmm. is actually a problem a problem because you might from the outside think that oh we have at least a basic agreement on what provisions there should be for healthcare services that includes sexual and reproductive health and rights yeah. but if we're not moving forward in this conversation after a generation mm -hmm. then we are actually not progressing in terms of women's rights so that is essentially the problem with the CSW space right now and what the U.S. has succeeded in doing this year is really bullying um, uh, across the room. Now, I won't specifically say the U.S. is only responsible for this. What has actually happened is that the U.S. government that, as we well know, is headed by uh, the, the uh, conservative party in power at the moment, appointed certain groups that I wouldn't even call civil society, um, including um, some groups that are considered hate groups within the United States, right-wing conservative groups that are completely against abortion, completely against um, comprehensive sexuality education, and are aligned with other groups, including with the Vatican and with other anti-abortion groups and so on. Hmm. These are the groups that, since some of them are appointed to, to the U.S. delegation and have strong support from the Vatican, which, by the way, is not even a U.N. member state, it's an observer state, um, they got, got together and they started this petition, and this included... Uh, methods of approaching the facilitator of the negotiations of CSW, including sharing her phone number and her email address and okay. really barraging her personal number with calls and texts, um, specifically addressing that there shouldn't be any language on abortion, there shouldn't be any language on conference of sexuality and reproductive rights. And this is really you know, problematic because the theme this time was social protection, public services, and infrastructure. And these are, public services in particular should include healthcare, and healthcare should include the, all of these elements. Yeah. So I think in some ways, if you look externally, it looks like, oh, we've just maintained the standards of the past, but the fact that we're discussing a topic that should have gained ground, and yet we got stuck because of the opposition from the US and a few small conservative groups is the mm. problem here. So in that sense, they were successful because they didn't let us go forward. They kept us stagnant. And, but you wouldn't say that we went backwards from where we were. We're still at the same point. Yes. I think uh, what we were able to at least stop was moving backwards. Hmm. Because somewhere in the middle of the process, there was this proposal for a paragraph on how the family is the primary source of social protection which, yeah. if you think about it, makes no sense whatsoever. The family does not pay you a pension. The family does not support you during times of unemployment. Hmm. So these kind of ideas that actually it's the family that should be providing 
uh, your your fundamental support system and that's where the woman should be and the woman should be at home as a wife and a mother these ideas were the ones that we were at least able to keep out um so we haven't moved back but it's a problem if in years and years of this work that we haven't moved forward and uh, focusing on this year's agenda which was to make social security and public services work for women what were some of the uh, specific directives given or you know which which we which came in the final outcome document and were these more focused on say uh, public services and the state providing these services or were they more focused on individuals relying on private entities to get the sort of social security and for women particularly to get social security and access to public services so this again is uh, an interesting question because this this also was a space of contention and i speak uh, directly of course uh, about the uh, the public uh, services um there there was certain um proposals about how um private sector should be uh encouraged should be providing services and so on and so forth but mm. i'm pleased to say that this faced very strong pushback um especially from trade union groups that uh, which along with feminist organizations have said that at the end of the day if you hand public services to the private sector this is harmful because it will not allow that those those services to remain um universal accessible and affordable for women the fact of the matter is that women rely on public services more than men Mm-hmm. and when it comes to certain sectors for example water and sanitation there's no way that you can run that for profit when you hand that over to the private sector and it's run for profit people are left out and they suffer and we and we have many documented examples of that around the world um from bolivia to indonesia you name it and uh, there were uh, reports that talked about how there are basically two kinds of oppositions to progressive agendas one is as we've discussed socially conservative or religious fundamentalist groups and the other is neoliberal uh market fundamentalist groups so can you tell us about like you know uh, in terms of the countries which were participating which countries aligned towards which agendas and which were more progressive in terms of approaching these issues so i think um th- th- there are, there are interesting groupings depending on different issues Now as far as uh the sexual and reproductive health and rights topics are the really regressive ones are the ones that I have mentioned the United States um the Vatican and then there's a small grouping of certain countries such as Saint Lucia a couple of countries from Africa that take a similar position and then there are some groups that maybe not don't have that angle around uh sexual and reproductive health per se but really want to focus on conservative values and what they call family values mm-hmm. and when they push family values it's also their way of pushing out any recognition of lgbtqia rights mm-hmm. and those countries would include bahrain malaysia um a few other uh, of their allies and friends who really don't want to have any lang- any sort of support for um LGBTQIA rights in any way and that's why they really strongly try to push for the conservative family recognition. Hmm. Now, um I am pleased to say that there is one issue at least that there's only one opponent really in the room and that's climate change. Thankfully, hmm. uh this is one issue that is recognized across the world that hmm. is an urgent issue that needs action. It's only the United States that even tries to deny that climate change exists the uh, the difficulty is of course that not everybody is on the same page with how we need to act because global south countries that are bearing the brunt of the uh emissions that came from global north historically would say that you know polluter pays principle which comes from rio uh an earth summit more than 20 years ago mm-hmm. the though that's where the contention but nobody is debating that climate change is an urgent issue now as far as support of private sector this is really interesting we know that the privatization of goods and services is something that is pushed for by certain countries you know that if you privatize um the health sector if you agree to trade and investment agreements that compromise your ability to produce 
um, generic medicines because you have a big pharmaceutical industry, then that is actually going to challenge your economy as well as the human rights of your people. Hmm. So this is interesting that there are lots of um, political splits along the way, um, depending on different issues. The countries that really strongly support um, progressive language on women's sexual health and reproductive rights are mostly the Scandinavian countries with some support from Canada and a, and a few other groups. Um, and then the Pacific Islands are the ones that have been really strong about progressive language on climate change. They're the ones that two years ago insisted on a clause that addressed what we call the just transition of, uh, they said specifically of the workforce, though I think a lot of the women's movement and the climate movement have been talking about the just transition of the economy, not just the workforce. And that is an important push there because um, we need to really talk about how, how climate change is not just going to affect the people, the agriculture, and the migration that's going to be driven by uh, disaster and, and rising sea levels. We also need to talk about how are we going to build a new energy sector, a green energy sector that is just and fair, and how can we retrain the workers in the fossil fuel industries to transition into that industry and so on. So those important conversations are being driven a lot by the Pacific countries. Can you also tell us about uh, what kind of discussions took place on the impact of austerity measures uh, and budget cuts of social services and public sector services in, uh, on, on women and girls? What kind of impact do austerity measures have on women and girls? So I'm really pleased that um, at least one element of the outcome document this time specifically says that progress is undermined by budget cuts and austerity measures. Hmm. So I think in, in like four or five years time, we have finally moved to a global recognition that austerity is really terrible. And any cuts to public spending is, is, is very damaging not just for women and girls, but for really the, the working class and the, and the working poor, really. Mm -hmm. So in that, in that sense, we, we have moved ahead a little bit, but at the same time, I think this is something that in terms of habits, uh, it's hard to move away from because uh, over here we're talking state to state and uh, with UN agencies present. But the actors that are not present in this space are the international finance institutions, and those are the ones that actually uh, uh, push forward for the structural adjustment policies, yeah. um, put forward the loans, and will be the ones pushing for austerity measures in exchange for loans. So um, I think uh, there has been increased agreement and understanding from some countries that this is a problem, but they're not quite sure how to move forward, especially the smaller countries with smaller economies that are much, uh, that find it much more challenging to stand up to international mm -hmm. finance institutions. So, as you said, there is some uh, progress here because we are recognizing austerity measures are bad and there are there is recognition of other sorts of gaps on and uh, uh, problems that exist. But since this document is not actually legally binding, then how effective do you think these discussions and the UNCSW as a whole is being to actually move these issues forward? Well, I think this comes back to our understanding of hard law and soft law and the role that both of them play together hand in hand. Um, nothing coming out of the CSW, which again, one of the oldest commissions, it was founded in 1947. So it's as old as India, actually. Hmm. That's funny. Um, the, it, it has done this every year, and the outcomes are, as you said, not binding. But it's, it, it works as a guideline for policy so that it goes hand in hand with the existing binding regulations. I mentioned CEDAW, for example, and that's the interesting dynamic of CSW, that many of the discussions have gone from CSW into other spaces and been taken forward as, as something stronger. Um, and the, the, the historic example is, of course, CEDAW, but even a, a lot of other guidance documents and policy documents have been based on the discussions that have come out of CSW. So that's the strength of that. But I do see that the weakness here is that a lot of the time, even when we have 
um, good developments coming out of the outcome document, it is a challenge to come back to the national level and mm -hmm. follow up with your governments and say that this is something you committed to. How is this going to happen? Mm -hmm. And I think the strongest example of that is last year we actually had um, really a good outcome in terms of support, a wide-ranging support, uh, more than ever before across the room for recognition of women human rights defenders, their work, and the fact that they should be included in conversation. Hmm. But uh, whether that in a year's time that has actually translated to governments recognizing that they have that responsibility to do that and to act on that, hmm. that I think we haven't seen yet. So that I think is the challenge and the weakness. But I would say that let's not rule out something just because it's non-binding, because at the end of the day, there's something very powerful about consensus and the fact that all of these governments have come together to agree that at the very least, uh, austerity is bad or that there needs to be a just transition mm. and so on and so forth. The fact that there is that consensus at least helps other actors such as civil society, such as trade union movements to take it forward and say that, you know what, at least we have an agreement that this is the base and we can build on that and move forward. And finally, you mentioned women's uh, rights defenders. So we, and you said that there were discussions last year that they are important and need to be protected. But we see a lot of right-wing governments in a lot of countries with right-wing governments have been increasing attacks on women human rights activists. So was there any explicit discussions on that and ways that, could, that it could be prevented? Um, not as much this year since it wasn't very tied to, or at least um, uh, governments and, and the UN agencies didn't actually understand as much how linked it is, the fact that women who are defending land rights, women who are fighting um, the setup of a dam and so on and so forth are also in a way playing a role as to the kind of public services, the kind of energy that should be uh, structured for the community. Hmm. That conversation, I, I, I'm afraid, didn't go forward as much in the context of this theme this okay. year. But And you're right that uh, there's really no stop uh, to the attacks on, on defenders across the world. That has been a challenge, but I think speaking uh, also as my organization, which is a uh, founder and co-convener of the Women, Human Rights Defenders International Coalition, hmm. uh, we also have to take a long view of this, where you know a decade ago they wouldn't even acknowledge that hmm. there is such a thing as a defender or that we have a role. I, it's very tough right now to just be surrounded by attacks and arrests and judicial harassment and cases being filed against women who are really just fighting for their communities and their uh, movements. But um, at least it's a step forward that there is recognition that, you know, we need, we need to do something about it. And I also think about this in the context of the fact that the Declaration on the Rights of Human Rights Defenders has reached its 20th anniversary last year. And so there are conversations taking place, not just in CSW, but outside, mm -hmm. about what else can we do to strengthen this and to make this part of law, to make this part of our community conversations, to make this something that has a cultural shift as well. Because a lot of the things that we talk about are also about changing attitudes. It shouldn't be okay to um, vilify, attack, or even troll online someone who is who is a, who is opposing a dam or a project that is going to displace millions you know hmm. so yeah that I'll, I'll stop there because I think there's so many myriad issues and and yet I want to say that there's potential to move forward mm -hmm. thank you Sanam thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion and that's all the time we have for today thank you for watching people's dispatch <laughs>